All right, well, good morning. Good to see you guys. Uh, that young lady was who we call Haley Mack around here. Where's she? Oh, she's slumped down in her chair on the floor back there somewhere. Uh, like I said a few weeks ago, man, I love seeing our students step up and really get involved and, and do some things uh, here as, as a part of the adult crowd of the church. That's just fantastic. I remember when Haley was three years old, just started coming to church here, you know, and to see her and uh, many of our other students just grow up in Christ and in our church is, is just fantastic. She mentioned that today is discovery class. Normally, that is the first Sunday of the month during second service. We had a little scheduling conflict and had to do that today. So if you were uh, thinking about attending discovery class and you missed the opportunity today, of course, it's still going on right now. You can do that. Uh, but just remember, first Sunday of every month, you can pick back up in April if you would like to do that and take your next step here uh, as uh, part of our church just to learn a few things about us and maybe you're thinking about uh, becoming a member of our family. We'd love to have you. That's your next, that's your next step. Um, sermon note cards. I have confession, okay? Normally, uh, with every series, we get sermon note cards and you would have gotten one of those as you came through the door this morning, I did not forget to order those, which has happened in the past. I did order them, and plenty of time for them to be here today. They've been on the, the shelf for weeks. But I came in the office this week, and I grabbed one of the note cards, and I was looking over it uh, one more time, and I turned it over to the back side. As you can see, the graphic, the background is, is black for this series. I turned it over on the back side where you write, and it's black. So, my bad, um, I should have caught that earlier. So, they'll be here next week with a colored background that you can actually write on and see what notes you have taken. So, I will fix that, and it will be here next week. So, that gives us a good opportunity, then, to plug the New Life Church app. I know there are some of you who are just like, you know, I just really like to take, you know, notes the old-fashioned way. <clears throat> Get with the times. <laughs> Save us some printing costs, but not. We love providing you with, with ways to take notes, but uh, one easy way, and you carry it with you all the time, is through the New Life Church app. If you're new here, you don't have the New Life Church app downloaded, go ahead and go to the, uh, the Play Store, wherever you get your apps, and download that. The easiest way to find it is to search New Life Church Locust. Uh, New Life is one word, capital N, capital L, and it should come up one of the first apps available. You'll see our little red splat cross there. Download that. You not only get sermon notes, but you can sign up for events. You can check out the calendar, see what's going on. Uh, all kinds of things that you can do through the app. So go ahead and take this opportunity to download that. So without further ado, let's jump in to our brand new series this week. Really excited about it. I'm always excited about every series, but especially this one called Hot Topics. All right? From now through Easter Sunday... We're going to be sort of turning up the heat. We're going to be discussing some controversial issues that I think not only people inside the church, but also outside the church wonder about, talk about, have questions about, even if they're not always willing to ask those questions or make comments out loud. And I'm just going to warn you that over the next several weeks, and perhaps even today, it will get a little awkward. It's going to be tense. But at the risk of upsetting some people, we're going to do it anyway. That's just the way we roll around here at New Life. Because uh, the thing is, when we address these issues, and these controversial topics, our goal is not to please everybody. Our goal is to not make everybody happy. It's just not going to do it. It's not possible but we don't care anyway. Our goal in this series is to please God. To go to His Word in search of truth. And then when we find that truth, to adjust our thinking and our way of living to reflect God's Word. We are going to champion the Word of God during this series. It doesn't matter how controversial it is. And it doesn't matter who disagrees or who agrees. It is what it is, as they say. Uh, so just to pique your interest and give you a little bit of a, of a preview, some of the things that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, uh, abortion, 
and other life and death, end of life uh, decisions and, and controversial topics. We're going to talk about the relationship between science and faith. There's a lot of people who believe that those two things are in competition. That, you know, they contradict one another. I happen to believe that science and faith complement one another. We're going to talk about that here in a few weeks. We're going to talk about um, our relationship with sort of the online virtual world. It's a part of our everyday life. Going online, Google searching, and uh, social media. Duffy's going to talk about, that's our student pastor, he's going to talk about how we as followers of Christ should conduct ourselves online, how do we maintain safety and integrity, and how can we be a good witness online in the virtual world. You know, Jesus said, go into all the world. Well, now all the world is not just the physical world for us. we got a whole new universe, a whole new world out there to take the gospel into. And so he's going to talk about that. Um, there's going to be one week where we talk about sexuality and gender issues. We're going to approach the question, you know, how many genders are there these days? And, and is that the truth? And is it, should we as Christians and Christianity in general sort of get with the times, as they say, and begin to embrace the idea of homosexuality and, and the rest? So we're going to go there and we're going to talk about that. Uh, last week, you noticed in your seat, you had some invite cards like this. I encourage you, if you didn't get a packet of invite cards or you left them here for whatever reason, grab a pack of these on your way out. You'll find them on a the table in the foyer and in the main connector. But on the back of that is an invite to Easter Sunday. I would encourage you to invite your friends, family, and all those to every Sunday, but especially Easter Sunday. And on the back of it is the question, the hot topic that we're going to deal with on Easter Sunday, which is, how can Christianity claim that there's only one way to God? Are we right? Or do we have that wrong? Are there many ways to God? Or is Jesus, in fact, the one and only way to heaven? And so, those are just a few. And so, as you can tell, it's going to get tense. And, and it's going to get a little, uh, like I say, maybe uncomfortable for some. But that's okay. I'm excited about it. Aren't you? I, I love making people feel uncomfortable. <clears throat> so why don't we get started today and just make everybody feel uncomfortable, including myself, because we're going to talk about us today. We're going to talk about us. Jump in our hot topics with both feet and ask this question. We're going to address this issue. You probably heard it in some form or fashion before. But the question is, if Christians really love Jesus... Why is there so much hurt and hypocrisy in the church? You ever heard anything like that? Or at least in some form? I certainly have. Because you don't have to look very far to find people who are hurt by the church. People who for one reason or another take issue with the church and church goers. It could be anything from recent sexual abuse scandals. It could be the fact that there has been countless stories about the embezzlement of you know, millions of dollars, thousands of dollars by people within the church, church leadership or whatever it might be. The, the issue is the church is not without its brokenness. And the church is not without its sin. And because that is true, the church, the reputation of the church has been damaged. And it's hurt a lot of people over the years. This might be a little bit dated, but uh, the Barna Group does a lot of research and study when it comes to you know, church and church trends. Back in 2010, they did a study that revealed that nearly 37%, that's like four, almost four out of every 10 people surveyed, 37% of non-church-going Americans said that they avoid church and they avoid church people because of negative past experiences when you dig into the data it helps explain why there has been a recent it's been somewhat slow 
but a steady decline in church attendance over the years. Another survey uh, that's, <coughs> that's well known is Gallup. Well, Gallup f- first did a survey on just U.S. church attendance. The first one was back 1937. And what they found back then was 73% of Americans said that they regularly attend or belong to a church. 73%. That's pretty good. It's almost three quarters of all Americans said they were affiliated and attended or belonged to a church. And the study or the, the statistics stayed that way for like the next 60 years. I sort of hovered around 70%. In 2018, a similar study was done. And it was found that for the first time in history, our church attendance dropped to and at below 50%. Since then, and you can find it today, American church attendance hovers around 37 to at best, at best, 47%. So in other words, over the last 80 years, Think about that. Over the course of all of our lifetimes, over the past 80 years, the church has not grown but has statistically declined. It is it's shrinking. Now, I know that I, re- I pay much more attention to things like that than perhaps the, the average churchgoer. But even hearing it, we have to step back and ask the glaring question, what's wrong with the church? Like, What's going on here? What is the problem? How many generations are we going to let go by? How many generations are we going to allow to slip through our fingers before we do something different? Because here is the harsh and horrific reality. If we continue this trend, it results in hundreds of thousands of lives being handed over to the kingdom of hell. That's what those numbers mean. Something's got to change. Like this has to stop today. And like any other area of our life, when something's broke to fix it, you have to first write this down on your non-note-taking cards. You have to identify the issues. If you're going to fix something, you have to identify the issue. And I've put that in in plural form there because it doesn't take long (coughs) to realize that there is not just one, but there are multiple issues with the church. Whether you're talking through uh, to your friends and family members, through your own personal uh, observation or experience or just you know, word that you get from people at large, there are multiple issues that plague the church. And it's been that way for a long time, not just like the past 80 years. In fact, many of the complaints that you and I hear about the church were evident and easily identifiable even in the times of Christ, in the times of of the New Testament, in the Gospels. And and so what we find is throughout Jesus' ministry, when he came across one of these issues, he called it out. He spoke about it as it was. And I believe that through the preservation of his word, he's still calling it out today. He's still calling sin, sin, and he's calling us to repentance. You might wonder, well, what are some of the indictments, some of the complaints that Jesus had against the church? What did he say was wrong with the church? Now, you could open up your New Testament and practically any page of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, find something. But in Matthew 23, what we find is somewhat of a cluster of complaints against what we will call the church of his day, the religious crowd. And in Matthew 23, this cluster of complaints is called the seven woes. What is a woe? A woe is an exclamation 
of grief, of pain, anger, and denunciation. He's calling something out. A woe, when you read it, should be understood as a warning and a call to do something different, to to make changes. I want you to listen to how Jesus began his woes, how how he sort of set things up. And this is Matthew 23, starting in verse 2. You can just imagine there's this audience or a crowd of people there made mostly up of common people like you and I. His disciples would have been there. But also there was likely some of the religious leaders mixed in with the crowd. And in verse 2, he says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do what they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Let's stop right there and just ask, what is Jesus saying? The teachers in the law, of the law and the Pharisees, he said, they sit in Moses' seat. What that means is they occupy a position of authority. They are the leaders. And as leaders, they have the responsibility to be an example and a model for others to follow. But he said there's a problem. Now the problem was probably obvious to all of those in the crowd. That's why they were so frustrated with their leadership. Jesus says their problem is, and he identifies two issues. One, they don't practice what they preach. The message may be correct, but the application is missing, at least in their own lives. And then he says if that weren't enough, they put heavy loads on others. In other words, they implement lots of rules and requirements that they themselves aren't willing to live by. In other words, they put the heavy load on, ev- on everyone else, but they don't carry it themselves. They live by the motto, motto, rules for thee, but not for me. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever noticed anything like that yourself in the church? Has anyone that you're affiliated with, associated with, a friend or a family member, co-worker, ever said anything like that about the church? I certainly hear those kind of complaints. Those kind of allegations against the church. You know something else I hear? I hear it in this passage as well in, as in everyday life. I hear the response of the Pharisees. Sort of what they're thinking. Because it sounds a lot like the response of the church. I hear the Pharisees responding to Jesus with something like, What are you talking about? You know, what do you mean? We 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 don't practice what we preach. What what kind of examples would you give that you know we require everybody else to do this or do that, but we we don't keep the same requirements? Well, Jesus responded to that. Even if they didn't ask the question, he gave them the answer. The answer is in the seven woes, the seven warnings. And he said to them things like this. He says, you've become an obstacle to those who are seeking to have a relationship and to know God personally, but you're keeping them from it. You're standing in the way. He said, you are focused on some of the less important matters of the faith while totally neglecting like the big things, like the major things. You know, so, sort of the whole, uh, you'll swallow a camel but choke on a gnat. That's what he said. He, he also said, you have and you live with this appearance of righteousness, like you've got it all together, and your life's perfect, and you're living according to, to God's law. He said, but in, on, on the inside... And you're full of corruption. It's disgusting. It's like looking at a whitewashed tomb. And he actually used those phrases. He says on the outside everything's gleaming white. It's like perfect. It's beautiful. But just under the surface is dead man's bones. 
And while he was giving these woes, he referred to them. He labeled the church. All right? He labeled the religious leaders as hypocrites, blind guides, as greedy, self-indulgent, the whitewashed tombs comment, and snakes. So in other words, Jesus made a lot of friends that day. I'm sure the crowd was as quiet as it is right now. Now, while Matthew 27, again, gives us sort of a collection of complaints, this is where we see uh, Jesus' criticism of the church of his day sort of concentrated. It's certainly not the only time that he took up issue and that he called them out for these things. Um, We don't have time to really go through all of the Gospels and highlight all of the times when he confronted the problems in the church. I would recommend to you a book that I've read recently. One of our members <coughs> allowed me to, to borrow it from them. It's called, What Made Jesus Mad? What Made, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, try. What made Jesus Mad? It's by Tim Harlow. He's a pastor of Parkview Christian Church in Illinois. And, and his book, the intent is to re-examine a lot of the, the events and, and the conflict that Jesus had with not only religious people but others of his day and point out that these were, these were the, the incidences of Jesus sort of addressing what's wrong with the church. Uh, things that need, to be, that need to be corrected and what stood in the way of people coming to and, and having a relationship with him. And, and a lot of what Tim identifies in his book as being graceless, joyless, judgmental, prejudice, or just simply steeped in tradition, a lot of what he describes are issues that people would identify as being what's wrong with the church today. So that's where we have to start. If we're going to begin to fix anything about what's wrong, we have to be willing to identify the issues. Now comes the second step, which is a little more difficult, and that is to take personal responsibility. You ever notice that it's always easier to identify the problem than it is to take ownership of it? It's always easier to point the finger and identify what's wrong with this or with that or with them than it is to point the finger here and say, how am I contributing to that? Do I have any responsibility there? Is this wrong because something that I'm doing is wrong? See, we always try to avoid that, don't we? I've seen it for years in the church. And maybe because I'm so close to like the inner working of the church. But I've, I've noticed, this is just one example, churches that seem to have a revolving door of pastors. That's why I just consider it such a blessing to have been here so long. But I, I've talked with other churches and, and uh, leadership groups within the church, whether it's a deacon board or an elder board or uh, just church people at large, and, and ask them, like, What's going on at your church to, to explain why you have a pastor coming and going every few years? Like, what's up with that? Every single time, the answer I get could be summed up this way. It's the pastor's fault. He did this. He did that. We didn't like this, and we didn't like that. It's always the pastor. It's never the church. It's never the church people. It's never the uh, laity uh, leadership, ever. You might notice it in people's relationships. As I counsel with with couples, and I ask them, you know, what's going on in your marriage? Why are you struggling? Listen, I'm not saying that Jessica and I haven't struggled. We certainly have. And, and some of the times when we struggled the most, it was for this very reason. But I ask them, why are you struggling? Why are you talking about divorce? Why are you talking about going separate ways? Usually, it's he did this, he did that, 
she won't do this, she won't do that. Couples rarely ever say and confess to, well, you know, Pastor, I'm part of the problem. I'm 50% of the equation. And here's what I'm doing wrong. I'll let him or her speak for themselves. But here's what I'm doing to undermine the relationship. That never happens. And we wonder why nothing ever gets resolved. It happens in the workplace. Maybe you know someone who, this employee, they, they always seem to be dissatisfied. They're in conflict with other employees. Or they jump from one job to the next job to the next one. And you ask them, what's going on? And it's always the boss. It's always management's fault. If they're always in conflict with other employees, it's always the other employee's fault. Never, never is it their fault. Well, most of us, you would think, as reasonable, common sense adults, would look at that and say, huh, that's awful childish. To always point the finger at someone else, isn't that what we usually uh, label that as? See, children, I mean, they begin, they begin as, as infants having no personal responsibility. It's not expected to be there because they can't do anything for themselves, right? But good parents will teach children as they begin to grow up the idea of personal responsibility, taking ownership of things. That's why we teach our kids how to tie their own shoes. Or we teach them to make up their own bed and to pick up their own stuff in their room. As they grow older, we challenge them a little more. Get your own job. You want a phone? Get some money and pay for it. You know, those take personal responsibility. It's good for them. It helps them mature and grow into responsible adults. They learn that with responsibility comes reward. With irresponsibility comes consequences. That, that's common sense. In fact, it's, it's biblical sense. The Apostle Paul, he said this in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. He said, when I was a child, I talked like a child and I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, when I grew up, I put away or I put the ways of childhood behind me. I set those things to the side. It's time for the church to grow up, to put away childish things, childish ways, and a childish mentality. How do we do that? Well, it starts with every single one of us taking personal responsibility with the issues of the church that we face. Again, it's a biblical concept that's all throughout Scripture, each person taking ownership and responsibility for themselves, for the good and the bad. One example is Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The Bible says, the one who sins is the one who dies. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them. And the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So each person answers for him or herself. And I just want to hit pause right now on the, on the message to make one thing clear. I know that in a message like this, it sounds as if I am saying that the church is an utter failure and disgrace to the Lord. That is not it. That is not what I believe whether it's the church at large, globally, or whether we're talking about this church. And of course, the church is not a building, it's not a place, it's not a structure, it's you, it's me, it's all of us who, who follow Christ. I do not believe that you are a failure. I don't believe that I'm a failure. I believe in the church. I believe that the church, which includes you and includes me, is God's chosen instrument to spread the hope of Jesus throughout the world. With all of my heart. And I am absolutely convinced that when the day comes, the church, the bride of Christ, will be presented 
to her groom, the Lord Jesus Christ, as a blemish-free and spotless bride. You know why I believe that? Because the Bible says it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. But, in the meantime, until that day comes, I am willing to admit that we got a lot of work to do. we got a lot of things to sort out. Some things to, to correct. There's some responsibility that needs to be taken for our behavior. And it starts with every one of us asking ourselves this question. Have I adopted some attitude or demonstrated some behavior that could be an obstacle to someone else coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about that for a moment. Have I? Don't worry about your spouse. Don't worry about the other church member in front of you, behind you. Have I? Have I demonstrated any kind of attitude or behavior that would be considered an obstacle to someone coming to know Christ? Am I doing anything or acting in any way that would stand in the way of someone knowing Jesus? Identify the issue. Take personal responsibility. And then third, this is the most difficult of all, Sort of like a three-step process in one. Repent, renounce, and replace. As I said, there's a lot of places in Scripture we could go to where Jesus addresses issues and you know, vocalizes complaints about the church all throughout the Gospels. But there is one final place that I want to take you to, and it's, it's interesting because it proves that the problems Jesus identified during his earthly ministry persisted. They weren't all corrected. But they remained, they persisted throughout time, even after the resurrection. Because where Jesus calls out the church again is not found in the Gospels. It's not found post-resurrection in the book of Acts. But it's found in what would represent many years later when the Apostle John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, picked up the pen to inscribe the words of the book of Revelation. So quite some time has passed. And in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we find what's called the letters to the churches. Seven letters to seven churches. I believe these seven churches were literal, physical churches that were located in very strategic and influential places. And there were some problems with these churches. Now, I also believe that these churches represent types of churches and types of individuals who make up these churches and what God would have to say to them. Now, out of these seven churches, this is interesting, only two of them have positive letters. Jesus spoke a message to them that was complimentary instead of condemning. He had no, no harsh words for them. But for the other five, man, he lit them up, scolded them. The church at Ephesus, the church at Pergamum, the church at Thyatira, the church at Sardis, and Laodicea. Like his message for these five churches was scorched earth, <laughs> you know. He really laid it to them. There are some harsh words, but I would describe them this way. Just sort of the, I can't read them all. Again, we're talking like two chapters worth. Write these things down, note for later, go back and watch the message at this point. But here's how I would describe Jesus' uh, sort of description or complaint about each of these churches. At the church of Ephesus. I would say he called this the careless church. Because this is the church where he said, you have lost or abandoned your first love. In other words, you need to get back to what's really important. To the church at, at Pergamum, 
His message was, you're a compromising church. Because (coughs) they tolerated false teaching, idolatry, and immorality within the church. The church at Thyatira corrupted. Because not only, again, did they uh, accept false teaching, but they led others into sexual sin and into idolatry. They promoted the behavior. Totally corrupt. The church at Sardis is the one that I like to describe as being comatose. Just like the Pharisees and the church in Jesus' day in Matthew 23, they presented themselves as being alive spiritually. They're thriving on the outside. Everything looks great. But Jesus says the problem is on the inside, truly spiritually, you're dead. There's no life in you whatsoever. And then Laodicea, we're familiar with this one. Um, I call it the complacent church. This is the church that Jesus says you're lukewarm. He says, I wish you were hot or cold. Either or would be acceptable to me. He said, but instead you're lukewarm, which makes me want to throw up. He said, I will spew you out of my mouth. To each one of these five churches... And to anyone who might exhibit their uh, type of behavior, he gives a common remedy. He has a common message. I want to see if you pick up on it as we read where it occurs. Starting in Revelation 2 verse 5, and we'll just skip from one to the other. To the church at Ephesus, Jesus said, Consider how far you've fallen, repent, and do the things you did at the first. To Pergamum, in verse 16, he says, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. To Thyatira, verse 21, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. To Sardis, chapter 3, verse 3, Remember, therefore, what you have received in her and hold fast and repent to Laodicea, the lukewarm church. To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Pick on up on anything there? <laughs> Any recurring word? Repent, repent. He said it six times in five letters to these churches. This is the remedy. Once we've identified the issue and we're willing to take personal responsibility, The next logical step is to repent, renounce, and replace it. To repent just simply means to change our mind and how we think about a certain thing and begin to adopt the mindset, the thoughts of Christ about whatever that is. In particular, certain sin. But that isn't far enough. Just to to begin to think about it differently or to see it in a different light really doesn't you know, change anything in the here and now, we must take the next step, which is to renounce it. That means we say, I'm done with that. I'm no longer going to think that way. I'm not going to behave that way. I'm not going to have that attitude. I'm going to turn away from that, and I'm going to go a different uh, direction, which involves replacing. Replace that behavior, replace that attitude and that mindset, and do something different, do something better. Now, to take this, these steps, it's certainly intimidating at times, and it can be extremely difficult. But here's a promise in God's Word. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 says that whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. In other words, you cover it up, you act as if it doesn't exist, you ignore it, you rationalize it, you're not going to get anywhere that way. But the one who confesses and renounces, walks away from it, says, I'm done with it, finds mercy the writer would go on in the very next verse in verse 14 and say blessed is the one who always trembles before God doesn't mean like you're just wrought with fear but you are acutely aware of his presence at all times and highly sensitive to your behavior and posture in his presence blessed is the one who trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Again, when we try to rationalize our behavior, 
We blame shift. It's someone else's problem. He says we fall into, into trouble. Listen, we need, we need to admit this. The church is not in the shape that it's in today. The church doesn't have all of these issues and doesn't have a falling reputation because one person messed it up for the rest of us. Whose fault is it? My fault. It's your fault. It's our fault. So if we want to share in the reward of being the spotless bride of Christ, we also need to share in the responsibility of fixing what's wrong. Let's begin to take that seriously and be the ambassadors, the image bearers that Christ called us to be. With every bow and every eye closed, it starts, again, by identifying, not, again, what's wrong with the church at large, or just what's wrong with this church, or what's wrong with you know, our church friend. Identify the issues within. How am I contributing to the downfall and the hurt that the church is causing others? What issues do I need to address in my life? What attitudes and behaviors do I need to correct? Start there. And if we'll all do that, think of the progress we'll make just today. Perhaps you need to begin a relationship with Christ, and that's sort of your starting point today. I would encourage you to come to Him in full submission and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, that you were buried and rose from the dead so that I might partake in the gift of eternal life. I receive that from you today. I believe and trust you as my Lord and Savior. Help me from this moment forward to live a life that brings you glory and honor. If you're praying that prayer to accept Christ into your life today, let us know about it. Fill out your connection card. Turn that in at Connection Central out in the foyer. For the rest of us, if you made that decision, that's, that's fantastic. But don't stop there. Be the image bearer the ambassador of Christ that God's called you to be. And right now, say, Lord, identify, shine the light on whatever might be in me, whether it's a mindset, an attitude, or a behavior that needs to be corrected. Anything, Lord, that might stand in the way of me being who you've called and created me to be or of me being that example and model for others, if there's anything that I'm doing or, or not doing that is standing in the way, that is an obstacle for those who need to have a relationship with you, God, let's remove it today. Let's deal with it. Whether it's a public issue or whether it's a private issue, God, we confess our sin to you today. Knowing and believing in your promise that says if we confess our sin, that you are faithful, you are just, you will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But God, don't let us leave here today believing the lie, which is the very next verse, if we say that we have no sin. Not only are we lying, but we're calling you a liar. Lord, we know who's really true. We know if there's anyone in this relationship between you and I, we know if there's anyone playing the role of hypocrite and being a phony, it's not you. Lord, it's me. So forgive me, Lord. Cleanse my heart of sin. And help me be the, the model and example that you would have me to be. Now and for the rest of my life, and may you receive the glory and honor for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.